Well, that's a fantastic uh, send-off. He gave me that beautiful piece of whatever it is. And uh, <laughs> I'm really honored to be here. I want to thank you all for your kind remarks and observations. As I was listening, I was saying to myself, who is he talking about? <laughs> However, I've been told I've only got about two minutes uh, in order to say thank you. So I say thank you, and I can sit down. However, uh, you've inspired me to go beyond the, the mandate. I'll only take a few minutes. And as I listened to all this and ruminated upon where we are and where we're going, I thought of a little story that most of you don't know and will reflect the spirit of Anne Frank. Uh, I was a liberator, as pointed out, to many concentration camps. That was my job to get in there fast before the records were destroyed, collect the evidence of the crimes, and later on, I was honored to be given the first trial of the subsequent proceedings after the Goering case to try the biggest murder trial in history as my first case. And uh, I convicted all of the defendants. 13 of them were sentenced to death. I wasn't so interested in the death penalty, but because there would be no justice in murdering a million people and hanging 20 people who were responsible. Uh, in order to the trial to have any significant value, it had to protect all people everywhere by its principles of law, which would be carried out and enforced. And that was what I asked the court to do. Uh, I didn't ask for the death penalty. I asked for a rule of law which would protect those who had been murdered simply because they didn't share the race and the religion or the color or the ideology of their executioners. And I got that in the judgment. But how to carry it out, that's another matter. When I entered one of the camps, they were all very much the same. My procedure was to proceed to the camp, the American officer who had taken the camp, tank commander usually, and I'd say, I'm here on orders of General Patton uh, to carry on war crimes investigations uh, on behalf of the President of the United States. I need 10 men immediately to surround the Schreiber Schruber, the office where the records are kept. And they would say, yes, sir. I had no sign of insignia that I was merely a corporal or a satron at the time. And I would then surround the office where all the records were kept. I came into one of them, and the Schreiber an inmate who kept the records said, I've been waiting for you. I have something for you. He said, come with me. And he took a shovel, and we went to the electrified fence, which surrounded all the camps. If any inmate touched that fence, he was dead. Um, and he dug a hole right near one of the posts to the tower, where the people on the tower couldn't see what he was doing. He dug up a little box, and he said, come. We went back to the office. He dusted it off. He opened it up. And in the, in the uh, box, there were dozens of little folders, something like the passport we have. And there was a club of the SS guards in the camp. And whenever they met in the club, which was re regularly, they got a stamp put in to this pass. And when the book was filled, he was to replace that, destroy the old one, and issue new pass. Instead of destroying it, he saved it. Now, so there I had a picture of the SS who was in the camp when he was there, the date of birth, uh, an absolutely fantastic piece of evidence if we have to have war crimes trials when they say, I wasn't there, I didn't know, I didn't see, etc. And he said to me, I've been saving this. And he knew, as I knew, that if they ever caught him keeping the old records, they would surely have sh killed him on the spot. So there at least 50 times he had taken his life into his hands, knowing or believing that there would be a day of reckoning and accountability uh, for the terrible crimes. And in fact, those records were decisive. And uh, in the Einsatzgruppen trial itself, I had, we had captured 
not only the distribution list of 99 people who said they never heard about it, these were the daily reports of how many Jews and others they killed every single day, who were the commanders, their name, when it took place, where it took place, and I had the record. Uh, so I was able to state my case in two days. I had won a scholarship to the Harvard Law School for my knowledge of criminal law, and uh, I said, I don't need more. I've got all of this evidence. So what does it mean to us today? I'm very flattered and honored by the kind remarks of Rabbi Seferstein and my new love. But she's, she, <laughs> I think she left immediately in, in, in terror. <laughs> <laughs> and also from the honor of uh, uh, the uh, ambassador of uh, Holland, which has, they gave me the Erasmus Prize, the king and queen. I was very honored by that. Uh, and there has been a general recognition that the world has got to change. The awareness that we can today, from cyberspace, cut off the electrical grid on planet Earth if we don't recognize that law is better than war, no matter what, uh, we have the danger of destroying all life on this planet. And I talk to the young people and I say, look, it's not my problem. I'm 100 years old now. It's your problem. And I'm here to try to save your lives. If you don't change the way you think about war, war is the supreme crime against humanity where the current system of where two heads of state are unable to agree, they send young people out to kill other young people they don't even know, and they kill each other until they get tired, and then they stop, they each declare victory, then they start again. And in the meanwhile, they spend all their money, instead of helping the people with their legitimate concerns for a decent living, spend the money to build more terrible weapons like the cyberspace weapons and the nuclear weapons to kill more people. That, dear friends, is crazy. That is the current system. And I go around and say it's a crime against humanity. It is genocidal, it is suicidal, it is just plain stupid. When will you change it? You have to change it. And you have people like John Bolton, who now advises the President of the United States, who says international courts don't exist. They are dead for us. We are Americans. We'll take care of our own. We don't need any new courts. It is the greatest danger today, in my judgment, for young people, that kind of mentality. And we've got to stand up to it. I don't stand very high, <laughs> but whatever you got, stand up for it. Do the best you can. I was a poor immigrant boy, and listening to these nice expressions, I think I made a difference. We have moved forward. We have a court with all of its problems, and it's in The Hague, in next to the Peace Palace as well, and tribute to the Dutch government, who has gone further than any other government in moving toward a rule of law, and I thank you for that. So. I've exceeded my time limit, but I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank particularly the very laudatory observations from the previous speakers. I do appreciate it very much, although I don't like to admit it. Uh, I've got to go back to work. So thank you very much.